At the tender age of 19, Sally Ann Bowman was on the brink of taking the world by storm. Her modeling career had just started taking off, and her acting and singing career wasn't far behind. With a future so bright that it was the envy of many, she was poised to conquer the world and claim her place among the stars. But then came that fateful day of September 25th, 2005. On this day, Sally Ann was out with her sister Nicole, celebrating the birthday of one of Nicole's closest friends. At around 6 p.m. that evening, the group made their way to a bustling pub in the heart of downtown Croydon, ready to raise a glass and make some memories along the way. Surrounded by laughter, clinking glasses, and the electric energy of a group of close friends, the night promised to be one for the books. As the night raged on and the drinks flowed freely, time seemed to slip away, and before anyone even realized it, it was now 2 a.m. The night was starting to wind down, and the group of friends was already contemplating their next move. It was also around this time that Sally Ann started making contact with her ex-boyfriend Louis Sproston, who she broke up with only a couple of weeks prior. Their relationship was a whirlwind of passion and conflict, and the couple fought and loved with equal intensity. Breaking up and making up was a familiar routine for the two, and on this night Sally Ann was determined to reignite the spark between her and Louis. She concocted a story that she was stranded in downtown Croydon and asked Lewis if he could give her a ride home. Lewis, who was out on a boys' night at the time, wasn't exactly thrilled that he had to leave his friends behind, but he also knew that he couldn't leave Sally Ann stranded. So he jumped in his car and drove towards Sally, picking her up at around 2.20 a.m. As Sally Ann and Lewis made their way back to her home on Blenheim Avenue, tempers flared and the two were soon locked in a heated argument. With emotions still raw from their recent breakup, every little thing seemed to set them off. They argued about their relationship ending, both accusing each other of cheating and blaming each other for why it wouldn't work out between them. The argument went on for two whole hours, with neither willing to back down, and eventually came to an abrupt end with Sally storming out of the car at 4.15 a.m. and Lewis speeding off into the darkness. Despite the tumultuous argument they just had, Lewis wasn't too concerned, as he had dropped Sally off just a stone's throw from her house, with her front door just a mere ten yards away. Lewis felt relieved to be rid of the situation, and thought that he and Sally Ann would sort it all out in the morning, just as they had always done with all their previous arguments. But unfortunately, this wasn't meant to be. At around 6.30 that morning, a neighbor went outside and saw what they assumed were the legs of a mannequin protruding from behind a builder's skip. After going over to investigate, they were met with a truly horrific sight. It was the body of Sally Ann Bowman. She was partially clothed and it was clear that she'd been murdered. The police were quickly alerted and an investigation was swiftly launched. They knew that time was of the essence and this crime would soon become one of the largest and most intense investigations the City of London had ever seen. This is the heartbreaking case of Sally Ann Bowman. When police first arrived at the scene, they were optimistic that they'd be able to bring justice for Sally Ann Bowman. The evidence was overwhelming, and they were certain that the case would be quickly solved. As they dug deeper, they pieced together a harrowing tale of a brutal and senseless attack. They were able to determine that at the time of the attack, Sally Ann was standing alone in her driveway, less than 10 yards from her door, when she was suddenly caught off guard by her assailant. The attack was ferocious and unrelenting, leaving Sally Ann with at least seven stab wounds. Three of the wounds were so deep that they went right through her body. There was also evidence to suggest that she had been sexually assaulted post-mortem, and the attacker had bitten her several times, leaving behind crucial DNA evidence that would later become a key piece of the puzzle. Louis Sproston was quickly identified as the prime suspect, he readily admitted to being the last person to see Sally Ann alive, and he even admitted that they had a fight that very night. Couple this with the volatile relationship the two had, and a clear picture was starting to emerge. The police suspected that this was a crime of passion due to the unnecessary amount of violence in the attack, and they were sure that the killer must have been someone close to Sally Ann. With all signs pointing to Lewis, he was quickly arrested and brought in for questioning. Over the next four days, Lewis was questioned relentlessly, and samples of his DNA were sent for testing to determine if it matched that found on Sally Ann's body. But despite the police turning up the pressure, 
Lewis maintained that he knew nothing about Sally Ann's death. The police, though, were convinced that they had their man, and they were sure that this was going to be an open and shut case. But then, a bombshell dropped. The forensic lab called with unexpected news. The DNA found on Sally Ann's body didn't match Lewis Sproston. Instead, it matched a disturbing sexual assault case from four years earlier, just a mile and a half away from where Sally Ann had been found. Lewis was released from custody, and the police were left grappling with the sobering realization that they might be dealing with a serial offender. The clock was ticking, and the police were in a race against time to catch the killer, whose crimes seemed to be escalating and could strike again at any time. When the police reopened the unsolved case from four years prior, they were hoping to find some leads that would finally unmask the attacker. The case in question was a chilling one dating back to 2001. A woman had been in a telephone booth at a local store when a man approached her. He exposed himself and proceeded to commit a sex act on himself before leaving his DNA behind on the floor. The victim was left shaken and traumatized, and despite having a DNA profile of the attacker, the case soon went cold. Now, as the police were investigating Sally Ann's murder, they were faced with a terrifying question. What had this attacker been doing in the years since the 2001 incident? And how many more victims had there been in the meantime? It was a chilling thought, and the officers working on the case knew that they were dealing with a predator who had been operating under their radar for far too long. Police then took a closer look at the events which occurred on the night of Sally Ann's murder, and that's when they made a shocking discovery. Sally Ann wasn't the killer's first victim that night. Just an hour before Sally Ann was brutally attacked on her doorstep, another woman had been targeted just a few streets away. The victim had been on her mobile phone when a man suddenly appeared and hit her without warning. If not for the timely arrival of a taxi on the street, the attack could have escalated into something much worse. The attacker fled the scene, taking the victim's phone with him. Shockingly, the person on the other end of the phone call could still hear the victim's screams, indicating that the attacker was hiding nearby and watching everything that was happening. The police were convinced that this attack could have easily escalated into something much worse had it not been for the timely arrival of a taxi on the street. Thankfully, the driver was quick to act and took the victim to a nearby hospital. She was able to provide police with a detailed description of her attacker, and the police used this information to create an e-fit of the suspect. Police hunting the killer of a teenage model have said they could be looking for a serial sex attacker. He's described as a white man in his 20s or 30s, between about 5 foot 9 and 6 foot. He's of proportionate build with short, dark hair. The police distributed the composite image in the community, hoping that something would come out of it. But despite the many leads they received, none of them was enough to identify the suspect. Despite police having a detailed image of the suspect and a sample of his DNA, tracking him down seemed to be much harder, and police knew they needed to be more creative. They suspected that the killer must have been from the local community due to the fact that his crimes all took place within a relatively close radius of each other, and they thought that he must have been comfortable with the area. They then decided to conduct a DNA screening of the area, knocking on doors and asking anyone to willingly provide a DNA sample in the hopes that someone related to the killer may offer up their DNA. The task before them was huge. Armed with a list of 6,000 addresses, they knocked on doors asking for DNA samples from every man who lived at the property or was staying there the night of the murder. The suspect pool was massive, a staggering 4,000 men who fit the killer's description, and time was running out to bring the killer to justice. They knew that it was highly unlikely that the killer himself would come forward and offer his DNA, but they clung to a glimmer of hope that a family member, such as a brother or father, might step forward and provide the crucial link they needed to catch the killer. But despite the initial promise, six long months had passed since the DNA testing center was set up, and the investigation was beginning to stall. The police were running out of options and were growing increasingly frustrated by the lack of progress, but then seemingly out of nowhere, they got their lucky break. On June 15, 2006, nine months after Sally Ann's murder, a man watching a football match in his local pub would firmly be cast onto the police radar. It was the night of the highly anticipated England versus Trinidad and Tobago match in the 2006 World Cup, 
and the pub in Crawley was packed with excited football fans. As the game began, tensions ran high, and soon one fan, fueled by alcohol, began to argue with another. Before long, the dispute spilled out into the streets and was captured on CCTV. After the man shoved the other to the floor, a nearby police officer intervened and broke up the fight and arrested the belligerent man. That man was 35-year-old Mark Dixie, and it would soon become clear that this seemingly minor altercation was just the beginning of his downfall. During the police interview, the man's behavior was baffling. Despite being taken in for a minor scuffle, he was sobbing and unusually emotional. Police then took his fingerprints and DNA in line with protocol, and he was eventually released on bail. Twelve days later, the DNA results came back and it was clear why the man was so emotional. His DNA was an exact match to that found on Sally Ann's body, and at last the identity of the murderer was revealed. Police knew they needed to track down Mark Dixie before he strikes again, but worryingly it turns out that Dixie wasn't in the country anymore. Immediately after being released on bail, he fled to Amsterdam. He knew that his DNA would be a match for that found on Sally Ann's body, so he escaped the country and tried to lay low. His stay in Amsterdam would, however, be short-lived, and only three months after arriving there, he got into a fight with his landlord and decided to return to England. As soon as Mark Dixie returned to England, he wasted no time in slipping back into his old life as a pub chef in Crawley. Police had done their due diligence and quickly found out that Mark was back in England and back at his old job, so they immediately started planning how they were going to arrest him. With his job giving him easy access to dangerous weapons, the officers knew they needed to proceed with caution. As they scouted the area looking for a way to apprehend Dixie, they spotted him coming out for a smoke break. They knew that this was their chance to pounce, so they moved quickly and took him into custody. The following day, Mark Dixie was charged with the murder of Sally Ann Bowman, and news of his arrest shocked the community of Croydon. He was not a name they heard before, and he wasn't on the police's radar. But a quick glance into his past painted a very damning picture. As detectives delved deeper into his past, they uncovered a litany of shocking crimes. Dixie had a long history of brushes with the law, predating the era when it was mandatory for DNA samples to be taken upon arrest. In 1986, he held a woman at knife point and robbed her, earning himself six weeks in prison. The following year, he was convicted of robbery, and in 1988, he was sentenced to two years for indecent assault and assault occasioning actual bodily harm. In 1989, he was found guilty of indecent exposure and slapped with 80 hours of community service. And in 1990, he was even found guilty of attacking a police officer. What investigators found truly chilling, however, was that Dixie's criminal activity wasn't limited to the UK. In 1993, he moved to Australia, where he soon ran into trouble again. He overstayed his visa and went on another crime spree. In 1998, he broke into a 19-year-old Thai student's house in Perth, wearing a stocking over his head and brandishing a knife. He stabbed her seven times, sexually assaulted her, stole her belongings, and fled. Miraculously, the victim survived the horrific attack. But Dixie wasn't done yet. On New Year's Day in 1999, he lay in wait for a young woman running along a road south of Perth, he leaped out at her and asked her to perform a sex act on him. He was fined just $750 for his actions. Finally, in April of that year, he was deported from Australia. Mark Dixie eventually went on trial in February 2008 for the murder of Sally Ann Bowman. Unsurprisingly, he pleaded not guilty. During the trial, the jury heard that on September 24th, the night before the murder, Dixie had been out with friends celebrating his birthday. They went to a pub on Brighton Road, only a few hundred yards from where Sally Ann had lived on Blenheim Crescent. That night his partner hadn't gone out with him. While in the pub he called her, and when he returned to the table, his friend said he was a completely different person. They later described him as distant, melancholic, and consumed with anger. When the pub closed at 2 a.m., he and two female friends who he was going to stay with that night left for their residence on Avondale Road just a stone's throw from Sally Ann's house on Blenheim Crescent. While the two women went to bed, Dixie remained awake. Police believed that he left the property sometime between 2.30 and 3.30 a.m., armed with a knife, with the intent of finding a woman and attacking her. Investigators strongly suspect that he was the person that attacked the woman on Sandy Stead Road and was frustrated when he failed to carry out his fantasy. He fled the scene and eventually made his way to Blenheim Crescent, 
a street he knew well from having grown up there, and actually moved out only a few years before Sally Ann had taken up residence there. While he was hiding on this road, it appeared that Sally Ann Bowman was tragically in the wrong place at the wrong time. He most likely witnessed Sally Ann and her boyfriend arguing in the car, and he patiently waited for her to exit the vehicle so that he could attack her. After Louis Sproston drove off, Dixie jumped out from behind the bushes and violently attacked Sally Ann and murdered her. Police believed that after he had killed her, he went back into the bushes to hide so that he could see if any neighbors would come out to investigate. When no lights went on and nobody came out, Dixie then went back to the body and sexually assaulted her. After his gruesome deed, he went back to the house he was sleeping over at and fell asleep on the couch. The next morning when his female friends woke up, they found Mark on the couch and said that he had acted normal and nothing was out of the ordinary. They didn't even know that he had left their property that night. After the state presented its case, it was time for Mark Dixie to deliver his defense, and what he came up with was nothing short of bizarre. Dixie admitted to raping Sally Ann and leaving his DNA on her body, but he denied murdering her. He said that he had stumbled across what he thought was a drunk girl lying unconscious on the side of the road, and he took the opportunity to sexually assault her. He said that while he was guilty of assaulting Sally Ann, he was not the murderer, and that the real killer was still out there. During the trial, the British police also shared Dixie's DNA with their counterparts in Australia, after they learned that he lived there for a while. His DNA was a match for the crime on the Thai student back in the 90s. The lady testified at Sally Ann's trial and identified Dixie as the man who attacked her. Dixie hasn't yet been charged in Australia for his crimes. On February 22, 2008, the jury unanimously found Mark Dixie guilty of the murder of Sally Ann Bowman. He received a mandatory life sentence with a minimum of 34 years behind bars, which means he will only be eligible for parole when he is 70 years old. In January 2015, after years of denial, Mark Dixie finally admitted to murdering Sally Ann Bowman. In 2017, Mark Dixie was charged with yet more offenses and it was revealed that someone had been wrongfully convicted for some of his depraved crimes. In 2003, a Dutch national was convicted of raping three women in the Costa del Sol. He served 12 years in a Spanish prison, while the real rapist Mark Dixie was a free man. In November 2017, Mark Dixie was given two more life sentences for attacks on two other women in Croydon. His crimes date back to 1987, when he was just 16 years old. He admitted to raping a woman in the deserted Wandle Road car park, leaving her bound and gagged as he set her car on fire. The victim was so traumatized that she moved to the countryside and tried to be as isolated as possible. Dixie also confessed to hitting a woman over the head with a chef's iron, leaving her with multiple skull fractures, and then dragging her to an isolated spot on Selston Road in 2002, where he indecently assaulted her and ran off with her mobile phone. He later used her phone to call her boyfriend and brag about what he had done to her. Louis Sproston, Sally Ann's ex-boyfriend at the time, was left heartbroken by her murder. He said that although they had a turbulent relationship, he had no doubt that they would have gotten back together, and that they would always find their way back to each other. He also said that he believed that if there hadn't been DNA evidence found at the scene, he would have most likely been wrongfully convicted of her murder.